Good morning. Welcome to our virtual nature talk about the City Nature Challenge and using iNaturalist. I'm really glad you could join us today. Before we get started with Craig Hensley, I wanted to tell you about the Phil Hardberger Park Conservancy. The Conservancy is a member-based nonprofit that bridges the gap between San Antonio and nature by bringing free nature programs to the public. They also protect the natural habitat of the park through advocacy, fundraising, and promotion. So if you enjoy the programs that we offer in the park, please consider supporting the Conservancy through a donation or by becoming a member. Visit philhardbergerpark.org to learn more. This talk will be recorded and shared on our website, so please turn off your video and mute your microphone. This will help reduce the background noise. So today we have Craig Hensley to talk to us about the City Nature Challenge. So Craig, the floor is yours. All righty, thank you very much. Um, it's nice to be here this morning and uh, hopefully everybody's gonna have a lovely weekend. Um, what I'm gonna go ahead and do is um, uh, um, uh, start the presentation here by sharing my screen. So let me do that real quick. There we go. That should do it. <clears throat> and since we've got such a small group uh, right now, anyway, um, feel free, uh, Susan, Sharon, I see is the name on the screen there. If you have questions, go ahead and type them into the chat box and we'll just answer them in real time as we go through the presentation. Um, so we'll go ahead and let's go ahead and get started. And um, hopefully you'll find this to be a valuable way to spend your morning. First of all, um, I work with uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife. I'm with a with the Wildlife Diversity um, uh, Program within the Wildlife Division of TPWD. And the group that I work with is called the Community Stewardship and Engagement Team. And we um, are a group of four people. And uh, what what my, my one colleague and I do is Tanya. Uh, we spend most of our time trying to get people interested in being community or citizen scientists. And we use the iNaturalist app kind of as our uh, carrot, if you will, uh, to try to encourage people to get involved in the natural world and help not only learn more about nature, but then also be able to uh, contribute through iNaturalist to conservation efforts and understanding of our flora and fauna across the state. Um, so as I mentioned, we are tracking, actually helping track uh, wild populations of plants and animals across the state using community scientists. Um, as I tell people, there's only one biologist um, per county in Texas with Texas Parks and Wildlife. So having a group, large numbers of citizen scientists out there also looking at observing and recording nature helps, uh, helps us have a better understanding of, of the flora and fauna of the state. Um, and then also your participation, if you get involved with it, um, the nice thing about that is that you get to learn. As I tell people, um, walking around using iNaturalist on your cell phone is like walking around with a gigantic um, uh, multi-volume uh, encyclopedia, if you will, of nature. And uh, it really does help in terms of learning what's around you, uh, documenting those things, and then it helps science at the same time. The way it works basically is that te Texas Nature Trackers kind of works between the naturalist community, the citizen science community, using iNaturalist and then taking data from those iNaturalist observations and getting it over to the research and conservation community. So we're trying to very uh, uh, get that data so that it's usable for conservation. We have in terms of our program, um, we have 12 different projects, uh, iNaturalist projects. We focus on what are known as species of greatest conservation need. And those are species that have a priority in terms of understanding and trying to do conservation to keep them from becoming rare or endangered species. All of the data that we, that we go through and vet um, ends up, potentially ends up in the Texas Natural Diversity Database. Uh, they have parameters on, on terms of accuracy and uh, identifiability of the, of the observation before it can go in there. But then that, can, that data, once it's in the da database, can be used uh, for conservation planning and design across the state. 
We do this as part of the Texas Conservation Action Plan. Every state has to have an, a conservation action plan of some kind. Um, we track about 1,300 species of, of SGCNs or species of greatest conservation need out of more than 12,000 that are found across the United States. And every state has one of these plans. Ours is in the process of being updated since the last time it was published. So what is an SGCN exactly? Species of greatest conservation need is a native plant or animal that is declining or rare and in need of attention to recover and or prevent the need to be listed um, either under state or federal regulation. Um, so how does one become a, an SGCN? Um, basically, it could be a species that was common at one time um, and then through habitat loss or other factors um, uh, that have played on its um, populations, it could start to decline at some point when that decline is recognized and considered significant enough by our taxa biologists and other experts, it's, it, it gets listed as an SGCN. Then at, that kind of kickstarts funding and research that goes into those species to try to figure out what's going on so that we can prevent it, again, as I mentioned earlier, from being threatened or endangered. Another way that we could be a uh, list of species as an SGCN is we simply don't have enough data. Uh, across Texas, we have a lot of caves, of course. There are a lot of organisms that live in those caves that are very unknown to science or very little known to science in the greater community. And so it might be listed as an SGCN until research can go on to figure out what those critters are. And of course, that's not just in caves, but all across the state in all kinds of different habitats and ecosystems. So who are some examples? Of course, some are very well known as the, such as the whooping crane that you see there. The Texas horned lizard is another one. The bobwhite quail is another one. The bobwhite is one that is a hunted game animal, but it's been suffering population losses uh, outside of that for a long, long time. So there's a lot of interest obviously and in work being done on that. And even birds that in some parts of the country are still common, in other parts of the country, they are not so much. The loggerhead shrike is one in Texas, parts of Texas, it's still fairly common, but throughout much of its range, that particular bird is disappearing. And because those birds come here for a winter time and mingle with our, our breeding population, there's real interest in understanding what's going on with that particular species of birds. And then again, you can see lots of other examples there on the page. Um, so just to kind of show you why all of this is important before we dig into iNaturalist, um, community science really has values. Um, it allows, in order for us to, to get more data, we need more quote unquote scientists out there. Um, and the best source of scientists are the, the greater community, the people that are interested in the natural world. And, and it, can, it can work, and I, this is one example. The Eastern Spotted Skunk is a species that is uh, pretty secretive, not well known um, in terms of where it is uh, and uh, how long it lives, all kinds of various things about it. Some, a few years ago, some research was started and conducted on spotted skunks trying to figure out where they are in Texas currently. And researchers selected 10 counties out of the hundreds of counties we have in our state um, and they put out camera traps, basically game cameras. They put out track plates, live traps to try to capture them. Um, and they did that over the course of what it were, it was known as 8,000 device nights. So each night a camera was out there, that was a device night. In all of that effort, they only got 12 detections in four of those 10 counties. Fortunately, at the same time, they also then put out a request to the community to help them determine where uh, the, the uh, Eastern Spotted Skunk was. As a result of that and going through museum collections and putting out a wanted poster for it, uh, they ended up with a, another 105 observations. Um, and in not only in the four counties that they found during your research, but an additional 22 counties including new county records for the species. So again, one example of how citizen science can be used to better understand the population of a particular species. Another way I was watching the, the uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife uh, uh, Commission meeting, uh, I believe it was a week ago or maybe two weeks ago now, and uh, a report came on, they were doing some squirrel hunting proposals 
updating that. And they threw up this slide, so I took a screenshot. That's why it's not a perfect looking slide, uh, but it shows the, the range of both the gray squirrel and the fox squirrel. And based on those, and this is iNaturalist, based on those iNaturalist records, they were able to make a recommendation to improve or increase hunting opportunities for those squirrels uh, based on, in part, on iNaturalist records from community scientists. Another project that happened, you know, we had the big winter storm that everybody talked about. We were, there was concern that a lot of animals died or plants suffered from that. And certainly that did happen. Uh, we were, it was, there was a request to begin an iNaturalist project in real time, immediately following that storm to collect data and encourage people to document um, uh, animals and plants, uh, mostly animals, but certainly some plants that, that died during the uh, storm or the aftermath of that storm. And so we're able to take that iNaturalist and actually create a real time project to collect data almost immediately uh, using again, community scientists to help us out. So just to kind of give you an idea, we are what our program is, Texas Nature Trackers, we have our own web page. So I want to review that for just a few minutes uh, before we get into iNaturalist. This is what our web page looks like. You can see the link below. Um, welcome, Gene. Um, Gene, if you could go ahead and mute, that would be great. Um, uh, that way that we won't be hearing you in the background and, and then me double voicing over, over your microphone, if that's possible. Um, so um, we have three different links on our, our web page. The first one is projects. These are the specific projects that we actually uh, help either manage or certainly do curation for, work with other agencies uh, in that process. Uh, one of the more popular ones, a couple of them, are the Herps of Texas and the Texas Milkweeds for Monarchs. The Herps of Texas is one of our oldest projects, has some of the most, uh, the largest number of observations over time. When you, collect, when you join one of our projects, you literally have to collect, select, join the project. These are called traditional projects. So you have to join the project and then upload your images to that specific project in order to um, uh, provide that data for us. Um, you can see right here, this is an observation. Uh, this is what the page looks like when you join. Um, and you can see there are well over 100, uh, I think now they're closer to 117,000 observations of reptiles and amphibians across the state that have been contributed through this project. You can uh, look at the terms and rules up there or join or leave the project from that little link up there that just popped up. Over the years, just to show you how that data has been used, the first five years, we got about 41,000 observations. After vetting those, looking specifically for SGCNs, we got in about 2,200 of them went into the Texas Natural Diversity Database. And then in eight, 17 and 18, we had another 65,000. So it kind of shows you the, the interest and the growth of uh, this iNaturalist project. Um, we got another 1,600 observations we were able to put into the Texas uh, Natural Diversity Database. And then most recently, in the last couple of years, we added another approximately 1,500 records. Um, and then we are in the process right now of doing another what's called a data pool and uh, we will take that data, vet it, and then put that on to the, uh, submit that to the Texas Nature, Natural Diversity Database, uh, TXNDD, so that they can get more additional observations into that effort. Texas Milkweeds for Monarchs is another project where we're tracking uh, milkweeds all across Texas, the Asclepius milkweeds. Um, you can see that there's some links for some information about monarch butterflies and, and milkweed identification. Uh, but you can join that project. And again, you can see there's been a lot of coverage. A lot of people participate in this particular project. And it's an ongoing project to have a better understanding of where, where milkweeds are. Because, of course, monarchs are migrating. And right now, they're migrating through Texas, coming back from Mexico. <coughs> Excuse me. So that information is valuable in terms of understanding where there might be deficiencies in milkweed, locate, or milkweed populations. Or are the milkweed populations doing fine? And that, that is a good answer to find out too. And again, that link, one of those links on that project page has this publication you can download as a PDF. It's a wonderful publication for identifying milkweed. So something to keep in mind if, if uh, milkweeds is something you're interested in. The next thing is I wanna show you is our next link is target species. These are species we're specifically looking for within uh, TNT. And you can 
You can search for those species by two different methodologies. You can choose the taxa group. So for example, if we choose birds, these are the species of birds that we're particularly interested in across the state and, and having people uh, help us with. You can also do it by ecoregions. You can select the Ed Edwards Plateau, for example. Then you'll get a whole list of all of that. And then when you select birds, it'll pull up the birds specific to that ecoregion. So those are different ways to find out what species are we looking for information about. And then you can target your searches for that when you're out and about. And then finally getting involved, and that's gonna take us right into iNaturalist. We're gonna spend the rest of the morning talking about iNaturalist, both the webpage and the app. Um, we'll, show, we'll go live to the webpage at the, towards the end. Uh, we're also gonna talk about the upcoming City Nature Challenge um, that uh, San Antonio is a part of. So we wanna make sure we encourage you to get involved with that. So first of all, iNaturalist. iNaturalist was not developed by Texas Parks and Wildlife. It was actually developed by some, the idea for it by some graduate students in California and it's turned into literally a global phenomenon. But iNaturalist is an online social network of people sharing biodiversity information to help each other learn about nature. That's their definition, great definition. There are pri two primary goals of iNaturalist as a, as a as a bigger goals out there, connect people to nature and then also hopefully generate scientifically valuable data um, uh, from those people's uh, encounters with the natural world. So it's a great way to get outside, explore nature, learn about nature uh, using this tool. For, for the way it works, basically, the very basic thing is you download the free app onto your uh, cell phone, you create an account, uh, didn't take hardly any time at all, you go out and you start taking pictures of things using iNaturalist. You share those with other iNaturalist users and the link and the web, the uh, app, of course. You can discuss findings, find out what it is you're looking at, and that information can then be shared with others. More specifically, how it works first of all, you have to create an account, as I mentioned. You have to have evidence of what you saw. It's either a photo or a sound on the app. If you have an iPhone, you can do sound, you can do you can do photo, you can upload photos, you can't upload sound, you have to do that a different way and then upload it through your computer. Um, on the Android, you can actually upload sounds and photo images, so keep that in mind. And then what you saw, that's basically what the, whatever the organism is, you're going to help classify what it is. So, for example, if you take a picture of a butterfly, you have no idea what kind of butterfly it is. You can take that picture of it, you can upload it to iNaturalist when it asks you, what did you see? You can say, well, I don't know what it is, but it, one of your choices is going to be butterflies. You can select butterflies. And the whole idea is then that, that by sharing that um, with the other folks, they'll help you be able to identify it. And a lot of times, iNaturalist, through its artificial intelligence, will suggest an ID that will be accurate um, uh, and help you out in that regard. When you saw it, knowing the date and the time of that is very important. And fortunately, when you use the iNaturalist app, that's already on there. Uh, it, it time stamps it for you, so you don't have to worry about that. And then where you saw it is also equally important. Um, the coordinates from your phone will document that. You'll have an accuracy to look at. We'll show you that on the app here in just a moment. Um, but accuracy can be really important, especially for data that's going to be used for conservation. Um, we have, uh, with our projects, we like to have everything within 500 meters in order for it to be a usable piece of data. Um, so that's important to do that. We can show you how you can adjust that as well. So around the world, this is just within the last couple of weeks that I po uh, that I copied this, but um, we're probably now we're getting close to or over 60 million observations globally with iNaturalist, which is pretty impressive, uh, if you ask me anyway. Um, we're getting close to 40 million observations just in North America alone. And in Texas, we're over 4 million observations. So Texas has a lot of iNaturalist users. There's a lot of data out there, obviously. And Texas Parks and Wildlife wants to take advantage of that. And we do that through our project and our projects and then other biologists and other people being able to use that to collect data. So when you get started with iNaturalist, but I mentioned that you have to create an account. So if you haven't created an account, um, I always suggest going to the website and I'll show you why in just a moment, but you can go log in www.inaturalist.org. Um, you can log in or sign up. Uh, the webpage, I should tell you, um, as a disclaimer, 
if your cell phone app is a data collection tool. The website is where everything that you can do with iNaturalist is located. So it's limited what you can do on the app purposely so that you can just collect data there and then go to the web page and uh, do all kinds of neat things there. And I will show you that again in detail uh, a little bit later this morning. So if you are um, uh, already a user, you can go to the, to the, the uh, website. You can type in your username password, you can sign in and you're ready to go. If you need to start a new account, there's the tab for that. You click on that, it's gonna ask you for a, to create a username, uh, provide your email, a password, confirm your password. One thing very important is to make sure that you have selected the right time zone for where you live. Uh, it used to default to Hawaii. I'm not sure it still does, but it does, uh, has in the past. So make sure it's selected for central standard time. And that's important because if you're doing a project that's a timed event, you want to make sure that the observations you're making go in there at that time and not miss out because you're set for a whole different time frame. So um, anyway, you can double check that, check that you're not a robot and you're good to go. So just a quick overview of the web page before we get into the, um, uh, the app. And then again, we'll, at the end, we'll go into the web page live. Um, online. So first of all, this is what your web page is going to look like when you open it up. You're going to notice that there are tabs all across the top. We'll talk about those a little later. But under your name, you're going to see that there are a variety of tabs as well. First of all, there's a profile tab. If you click on that, that's where you're going to check. You can check to see the, the uh, time zone there. You can add a description of who you are. You can upload a picture. You can do all kinds of editing of settings in this particular um, uh, tab. When you click on observations, these are going to be your observations that you've put out there. And you'll notice that a couple of things here, you can do some editing here. You can either batch edit or you can edit a whole lot of observations at the same time. You can add observations from here or upload observations over here. And then also under each observation, if you click on that observation, you can go in and edit them, um, add more photos of that particular observation, whatever you need to do in there. Uh, another thing to notice is that right here, it says needs ID. And then this one down here says research grade. The goal of, uh, for us is to have those observations that we're going to use for conservation purposes to be research grade. And what that means is that if you identify something and the next person comes along and checks your identification says, yep, I agree with you. That means that both of you have agreed with the identification that becomes research grade. It's basically two thirds of the people that look at an observation have to agree on the identification It becomes research grade. The reason some things don't become research grade and still need ID, it may be that the picture quality is poor. It may be that the object that you photographed is so hard to identify from the photograph that it's just not possible. Or it could be something that is planted in your garden or it's a captive animal. And those things won't be generally go to research grade either because those are captive or cultivated. And we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. The next tab I wanted to share with you are IDs. One of the other really cool things about iNaturalist is let's say you, you can't get out and you're out walking around and you hurt your knee or whatever, you can't get outside, you can go to iNaturalist and help with other people's identifications, confirming them, um, for suggesting identifications. Um, so when you click on that link, these are all the observations that you have actually helped other people identify. And that's really powerful. That gets their observations to uh, I natural, so it's a great time. I, my office is surrounded by field guides of birds and reptiles and amphibians and dragonflies and everything else. Um, I can pull those out and uh, sit down with a particular group of, of, of uh, organisms and help people identify them if I feel like I have some expertise in that area. And we'll show you how you can do that live as well here in a bit. This is what, when you click on that, this is what it's going to look like. And you can notice you can identify, you can sort by species, you can sort sort by location, um, and then it'll, it'll populate all of these choices and you can go through and, and figure out what's going on. And then the last tab I wanna show you is projects tab. Uh, this is where when you click on projects, it's gonna show the projects that you've joined or you've created and you can create projects in iNaturalist uh, once you have 50 verifiable observations. Um, and, and we may not have time to show you that today, 
but um, it's, it's something you can learn through the uh, help tab uh, on iNaturalist. And then all projects, let's say you want to go search for a project. Once you click on projects, you can click on that tab, all projects. It'll take you to a page that looks similar to this. You'll select search. You can type in, let's say we type in butterflies. We want to see what butterfly projects are out there. Uh, when I do that, I at that time, 806 projects about butterflies. Now you can also do butterflies, Texas. You know, you can, you know, narrow your search as well. I did butterflies and one of the things I noticed right off the bat is that very top project is uh, Butterflies and Moths of New Zealand. I have a son and his family that live in New Zealand. So when I go to visit, this will be a project I'll probably join so I can find out what's being seen. So when I get there, I can go searching for those kinds of things. So you can use these projects for travel plans when you're going out and looking at nature and finding out what's going on. Um, it's a great way to kind of uh, find out what's going on uh, in those places. There are different kinds of projects. One kind of project is known as a BioBlitz. Um, basically, Cibolo Nature Center, where I, my office is, has BioBlitzes periodically. And then if you go and look at, for Phil Hardberger Park, there's an ongoing BioBlitz there. This is started in, in, in uh, I believe it was 19, or 2020, in 2019, December 5th, by the uh, um, uh, Alamo Area Master Naturalist Class 45. And it, I looked today and it's actually still going on. You notice that over 5,000 observations from inside Phil Hardberger Park. Uh, but a bio blitz is basically an effort to record as many species as you possibly can in an assigned period of time. So if I go back to um, uh, Cibolo Nature Center, that's usually, here's a, here's a five day period that they used. Um, this particular one's been going on for a year. So it's a time-based thing and takes all the observations in and gives a snapshot of what's going on with nature at that time. Other kinds of projects can be very taxa specific collection projects. A collection project is basically where you create a project and if somebody takes a photograph of an, an, uh, a plant or animal that's part of that project, um, it will automatically be uploaded into the project. You don't even have to join it. So for example, this one is done at Guadalupe River State Park, a project I started some time ago. And so anybody that's in that boundary of Guadalupe River State Park and takes a picture of a butterfly, it will actually pull directly into this project. And you can see over the time, the last couple of years of this project, we've put in 84 species with almost 2000 observations from 82 different observers. So a lot of contributions can be done with that. And then you can even have your own property-based individual collection projects. So this is an example of what I do at my home. Um, I'm doing a lot of restoration work, putting in native plants. And then I want to document how are those native plants doing? What are the insects and other critters that are attracted to my yard as a result of that? You can see that we're up to 268 species of plants and animals that have uh, flown over or stopped by my yard or have been planted in my yard. Um, and that's kind of exciting. These are photographs here that were taken. I just took in the last couple of days of flowers that are starting to bloom in my yard. So this is a way to document what's going on in your world. So specifically, it could be your yard, your ranch, your acreage, wherever that would be. It'd be a way to, to uh, document that kind of things for your own purposes. So let's take a look at the app. And again, we'll go back to the website live here a little bit later. Um, uh, so to again, you can create an account on your phone, either the iPhone or the Android, uh, but you can't check the time zone on the Android on your cell phone. So that's why I suggest when you create an account, if you haven't yet, or you're helping somebody create an account, go to the web page. It's a little bit easier to do, and you can check that. There, are, your app is going to look like this on your cell phone, and then I also wanted to point out, and this is what it looks like when you open it up. This right here is another app called Seek. Um, that was created by iNaturalist for younger users, those that uh, doesn't require an account. Uh, younger users use it, older people use it, anybody can use it, but it's specifically to engage children under 13. And, and that's to guard them against pri with privacy considerations so they're not giving out personal information over the internet. But basically it's a little bit of a, uh, it's iNaturalist um, pared down a little bit. The data doesn't go up into iNaturalist using Seek, but you can take and point your camera at a, an object in the Seek app, and it will suggest the ID for it. You can take a picture of it. 
Uh, you can keep track of what you're seeing. You can earn badges that they've kind of gamified it a little bit for kids. Um, so it's a really neat little app. Uh, again, the data doesn't go directly to iNaturalist, but it's still something to engage if you have a grandchild or child, you wanna get them out in nature, this is a way to do it using their technology that they have. So when you open again, when you open up your app, this is what it's gonna look like on the, on the next series of slides. We're gonna have the iPhone on the left and the Android on the right. Um, obviously this is a little while ago, only 314 observations. I've grown from there. Uh, but let's say you want to take an observation. So you've opened up your app and you're going to observe. So first of all, right there, you're going to, on the iPhone, you're going to click on that tab right there. And on the Android, you're going to click on the circle, the green circle with the plus sign. Okay. Now what you're going to notice when you do that, it's going to take you to a page that looks like this. And it's going to give you three choices. You can either make an observation with no photo. Now, no photo means that it's not going to become research grade because there's no physical evidence of it, but you can still do it. It says, say you saw some rare bird fly by and you recognize it, but you couldn't get a picture. You can still document it on iNaturalist um, if, you're, if you're certain of the ID. You can either use the camera or you can use your camera roll. What your camera roll is, is all of those photos that are on your iPhone or your Android that you took with your device camera, okay? And one of the things I, I want to make sure I, I mention is when you take a picture with the iNaturalist phone app part of it, you can't edit the photograph. But if you take a picture using your cell phone camera, you can edit that, po that picture and make it larger, make it better, easier to see. And then when you open up iNaturalist, you can go and you can select camera roll, go select that photograph pull it into iNaturalist in that manner. And I'll show you how to do that here in just a moment. So anyway, I go out and I take a picture of something right here. And this is where the, pop, the picture populates. You can see it on both of these uh, versions of the app. Um, you'll notice there's a, a box with a plus sign and a box with a plus sign and a camera over here on the Android. Let's say you take one picture. It's not, it's not good enough. Maybe you want to add a couple more pictures. Um, you can click on those boxes and it will reopen the camera so you can add another photograph, okay? So you can continue to do that. And with a lot of things like plants and like insects in particular, having multiple pictures helps with the identification either through the artificial intelligence or the people that are out there helping you to ID the, the image. So net, next thing you're going to do once you've taken the photograph, you're going to click on what did you see here and here, and it's going to offer suggestions. It's going to start out with basically a genus. So it's going to start out with a large group of organisms. So that way, if you don't know, you know it's an oak, but you don't know what kind of oak, you can just select oaks, right? But now if you know the species, it's also going to give species suggestions. If you know it's a Texas live oak, you can click on that and that's going to accept that as the answer. If you're, again, if you don't know, you can click on it here and it's kind of a placeholder and other people can help you go back and identify it a little bit later. So I'm gonna click on Texas Live Oak. By the way, this is kind of mind blowing when you think about it, um, that you can point your camera, your, your app at something and it can help you identify what it is. Really a mind blowing experience. So now we're gonna look at a few other things. You notice that date and time are stamped on here already. So you don't have to worry about that. Here is your location. Notice that the accuracy right here is lat longitude. Here's accuracy of 128 meters. Here's accuracy in the same photograph taken in the same spot. The accuracy is six meters. Both of those are acceptable for our purposes. Um, but the reason that happens is that it may, it, it has to do with what satellites are picking up your phone at that time. So the accuracy can vary a little bit. If you want to go and check on the accuracy and make sure it's where you took the actual photograph, you can click on those tabs and you're going to pull up either a, a um, satellite map or a regular map. And then if you move that around, and you put that location right there the best you can, right there in that middle of that bullseye and click save, it will readjust your accuracy and get it down to where you want it to be. The next thing that's important is geo privacy. Some people, uh, a lot of people ask, well, if I take a picture of something on my property and I don't want to share the location of it, um, then how do I protect myself from that? And I help, how do I check that plant or animal? Basically, you go to geo privacy, you open it up, you're going to be given three choices right here. It defaults to open, which means that not only do people see the image, they also see the uh, coordinates for that image. 
But if you want to obscure it so that people can't see the exact location, you can click obscured um, and it's gonna give you a big blue box within 22 uh, square, square kilometers with a random point in there. Or you can private, you can make it select private and that will completely leave it off any map out there. And the only people that can see those two, by the way, or any curators for projects that you've joined and are allowing them to see. So you can control that, which is real valuable for a lot of landowners. And then finally you have, is it captive or cultivated? So if it's a wild organism and you know it's a wild organism, you just leave it at no, that it's not captive or cultivated. But let's say that like at my house, I take a picture of one of my wildflowers that I planted. I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna say, click that to yes, it is, it is a cultivated plant. Again, that plant probably won't go to research grade, um, but it's, it's important that we, we note whether it's cultivated or captive because if it's picked up for conservation purposes later and it's, it's not a natural wild specimen, then we're kind of getting bad information on that. All right, so the next thing you wanna do is you're done. You've, you've done all of that. I am gonna show you one more thing in terms of projects. Um, uh, in just a moment, you can see that it says projects down there on the left. Uh, but let's say we're ready to share it. So you're going to click share on the on the Apple. You're going to click that that check mark box up there uh, on the Android. It's going to sync the observation in real time and upload it. And boom, there it is. There's your new observation. You're ready to go on to the next uh, photograph or observation that you are going to make. Now, let's say you're out doing a bio blitz or you're doing, you're taking lots of pictures. I was just out in West Texas and I was taking pictures of lots of things, um, but the satellite, you just can't, you don't, there's no, nowhere to upload it because you just don't have any signal strength. So what you can do is change one setting on your phone, uh, whether it's a local bio blitz or somewhere out in a remote area, so that it's not trying to upload every image one at a time, which is slowing you down. The way you do that is, um, Let's see here. Oh, you know what? Before I do that, before I do that, I guess I inserted this here. This is a brand new addition to my presentation. Let's see here. I'm going to go back one more. So, so let me go. Let me backtrack just a minute before we go to that. Um, so you're done with that observation. Now, let's say you have taken pictures on your I phone your camera. I can't either. <laughs> Hi. Hi there, thanks for joining us. If you could go ahead and turn your uh, mute, mute your microphone, that would be awesome. Thank you for joining us, by the way. Thank you. Um, so let's say you've taken pictures on your camera and you wanna upload it to those photos into iNaturalist using the iNaturalist app. So instead of choosing camera to use the iNaturalist camera, now you're gonna choose the camera roll. You open that up. And what you're going to do is you're going to select the photograph that you want to upload. And let's say I wanted to do both of these. I could click on both of those and upload both of them at the same time, by the way. And then what I'm going to do is once I click on that and I hit add right up here, it's going to upload this. And remember, this is exactly what you saw when we did it through the phone uh, or through the app camera. Um, and now you're going to make your selection. You're going to do all of this. Notice down here. Because this is in my yard, I've gone ahead and switched from uh, the no setting, the default setting to yes, to make sure that they know that it's a cultivated plant, okay? And then I'm gonna hit share just like I would. So this is a way to go to from your, use your camera roll to upload images to iNaturalist. And now, now let's talk about projects. So now I wanna join projects, okay? So before I upload it, if I click on projects, what you're gonna see you're gonna open up to this right here. And these are all projects that you've joined. Um, and I'll show you where that is on your webpage. There are two kinds of projects. One of them are projects you join, and then you have to physically choose that project by selecting the toggle. So notice these toggles are off. So if I wanted to add this project, this observation, for example, to um, uh, Texas milkweeds and monarchs, and I wouldn't because it's not a, a milkweed, I would move that toggle and it would light up green. And now I can go ahead and continue. Um, other projects that you join are projects that are collection projects where it just grabs your observation and pulls it into the project. You don't have to do anything to do that, okay? So that way, those are all going to automatically upload to that project. So that's a big difference. 
the Texas Nature Trackers projects are are traditional called traditional projects, which means not only do you have to join them, but then you have to choose that project before you upload so that it goes to that project. It's a couple of extra steps, but it's done because th these kind of traditional projects are easier to get more data out of for conservation purposes than a collection project is. That's one reason. So now let's say you're, uh, you're out and you're doing a whole lot of, 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 of work and you're taking picture after picture after picture and you're in like Big Bend where I was last week and I didn't have a signal so I couldn't upload them one at a time. What I'm going to do on my iPhone is I'm gonna select this little gearbox right here, which is my settings page. I'm gonna to go to settings. I'm gonna to go to this tab where it says automatic upload. Notice the toggle is on. I'm gonna turn that off. And what that's gonna allow me to do now is take an image, save it, take another image, save it. And I can do that all day long. Then when I get back to where I've got a good signal, I can go back and turn that automatic upload tab back on. And now I can upload all of those images at the same time. All right, so now let's say you've got an Android and you wanna do the exact same thing. We've got an extra step you have to do that with that. First, you have to click on the hamburger right here. Then you're gonna click on, you're gonna open this screen here. You're gonna click on settings. You'll notice that this is checked, which means your automatic upload is on. So what you're gonna do now is take it and unclick that. So again, you can go out and take picture after picture after picture, save those, upload later when you turn that, that um, uh, feature back on, okay? Hopefully that's not too confusing, but that can be really, really valuable, especially during a bio blitz, especially when you're out in remote areas and don't have a good signal strength. So now just to show you that um, iNaturalist is not perfect, okay? This was an image taken by my coworker's husband. It is of three black vultures. When he at when it said, "What species is this on iNaturalist?" These were the choices: American black bear, American crow, wild boar, American bison, and common raven. Um, I personally like American bison the best. What a what a, uh, that's some weird looking bison, two legged bison, I guess. Um, well, first of all. Uh, the black bear disagrees. It is not a black bear, but this, I wanted to show you this because it really did happen. And it just shows you that iNaturalist is really good, but it's not perfect. So a couple of things to remember when you're out taking pictures of things, it might identify it wrong and you'll have to correct it, okay, by typing in something else um, that is more correct. Or um, there are certain times with a lot of things, especially insects, that you simply can't identify it, and iNaturalist can't identify it from a photograph. And for an example, there are over 4,000 species of bees and wasps, bees in North America. And a lot of them are so tiny that you have to dissect them under a microscope in order to identify them. And it doesn't matter what picture you take, you're never gonna get it to species, but it's okay. You can put it to family, you can put it to order, you can put it to genus. Um, that's still valuable data but you can't expect iNaturalist to be 100% perfect um, all the time. It just isn't gonna happen. It's unrealistic. So now let's talk very briefly about photography tips. Uh, because when you go out and take pictures, you can take really bad pictures and, and iNaturalist can't identify them and neither can anyone else, blurry, too far away, things like that. And so I wanna show you what, I, what I've kind of learned by using iNaturalist and give you some ideas of how to do it. The first thing when you come up, especially with plants uh, or in sometimes insects, when you're doing close-up photography, your camera only can get so close before it's, it becomes blurry, even though the new phones get better and better with their cameras. But I also then purchased recently, I purchased this thing called a Zenvo Pro Lens Kit. And what it has on it is a 15 uh, power magnify, macro lens on it that you can attach directly to your cell phone and you can take some amazing close-up photography of the different things that you're looking at and get all kinds of detail. And that detail can help identify what it is you're trying to uh, uh, share with everybody else. So that, these three photographs were done with this little Zenvo. It costs about $40. Um, uh, you can get it through Amazon. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I don't have stock in the company or anything like that. Uh, but it really is a good device to aid you, especially when you're taking pictures of small things. Um, it really gives some outstanding photographs. 
The other thing I wanted to mention is that you can use a camera to take pictures uh, and then upload those to, from your computer onto iNaturalist. And I'm gonna do that, show you, demonstrate that for you here in just a little bit so you can see how that works. Um, a camera like this, I think this is a cool P900 that I was issued when I, when I came to this job. This takes wonderful pictures of everything from close-ups all the way out to birds that are 50 or 75 yards away from you. So you don't have to have invest, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in camera equipment to be able to utilize those photographs for iNaturalist. So I just want to give you a heads up on that. So let's go to some specific topic areas. So if I'm taking pictures of wildflowers, one of the things I'm going to try to do most of the time, unless I know what it is right off the bat, I'm gonna take a picture of the flower. Sometimes I've got to edit that picture to make the flower look bigger. So I'll do that on usually on the computer. Um, and then I'll also take pictures of the side of the flowers because there may be things there that might help with identification through iNaturalist or other iNaturalist users. And in the case of this particular plant, knowing what how long the sepal, sepals are right here um, is very important for identification. And the other reason I put my hand, I put my hand in here because I didn't have a ruler. I put my hand in here. Now I've got a way to measure the length of that versus the length of my finger. So that gives me a kind of a, a useful tool for helping in identification. I'm also going to take a picture of the leaves and the stem to show what that looks like. And then I'm also going to take a picture of the entire plant when I need to. So the more pictures you add in a particular observation, the better accuracy you're gonna have in terms of identifying it through iNaturalist or through other users that are helping you out with iNaturalist. And then when it comes to woody plants, the leaves are obviously are very important. You wanna get a nice picture of the stem that shows where all the leaves are. A lot of times the underside of the leaf will show the veins much clearer than the top side. And a lot of times there are hairs or other things underneath those the bottoms of the leaves that come in handy for identification. So keep that in mind as well. And then of course you have different kinds of leaves. You have leaves that are known as simple leaves where the, all of the leaf material is within bound within one leaf basically, known as a simple leaf. And then you have, by the way, the way you find out if it's a simple or compound leaf, just a little natural side note here, you look for the bud. If the bud is here on the stem, whatever's coming out from below that bud is the leaf. In this case, if I followed the stem that went all the way down to the branch, I would find that the bud was at the base of that. And all five of these, which look like individual leaves, are actually known as leaflets. So this is a compound leaf. So I want to make sure I get, get a good picture of the entire bit of the compound leaf um, and not just one of the segments, because that'll help with the ID. Also, another thing, if you've ever sat down with a taxonomic key, um, to identify plants, woody plants. Um, you need to know, are the leaves alternate on the stem or are they opposite one another on the stem? So make sure you document that as well. That will just aid in identification. Plus you'll get to learn a little bit more about the plants you're looking at. And then another thing to keep in mind is bark on some trees and plants can be helpful. If you find things like tendrils, um, like on grapevines, things like that, photograph that. If you find spines or prickles, photographs of that would be valuable. Um, here's the fruit of beauty berry right here. And then here are the flowers of the Mexican buckeye. So all of these things can aid in identifying that particular woody plant. When it comes to insects, two of the groups that really get a lot of attention, of course, are damselflies and dragonflies and then butterflies. Um, when you're taking pictures of dragonflies or damselflies, one of the things I've learned over time is that they're very territorial. And so they like, they have favorite perches that they will land on um, and over and over and over again. And so if you can get close to that perch and just be patient, a lot of times that critter will come back and land on the same perch and then you can get your photograph. Same thing with drag, this, the first photograph is a damselfly. Second one is a dragonfly. And again, I stood right next to this stem kept watching, he, the, the dragonfly showed back up, I got the picture. So you can do that, but it requires patience and effort. And I, I'm a nature photographer, so I, that I've got, I bound, I've got all kinds of that sort of uh, patience that, and some people may not have, so I recognize that. All right, when it comes to butterflies, one of the things I wanted to mention, there are lots of different colors, kinds of butterflies, especially in the San Antonio area and throughout Texas. Uh, these two butterflies, if you looked at them real quickly, you might not think you might think they're the same thing, just a little blue gray butterfly. 
but take, keep taking pictures of them. You'll find out a lot of times that these are individually different species. So we have the, the dusky blue ground streak right here and a gray hair streak up here. So keep taking pictures of those critters with wings open, wings closed. If you can get both, that's awesome. A lot of times you can't, so get what you can. And then sometimes the characteristics that help you identify the butterfly are best seen when the sun is shining through the wings, as is the example of these two sulfurs. So sometimes that, you, normally when we take pictures, we want the sun behind us. Sometimes it, it's beneficial to have the sun uh, on the other side, as you have right here. Uh, this is a southern dog-faced butterfly, by the way, and this is a, uh, a, 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 a cloudless sulfur. And now when it comes to birds, tricky with birds is that birds fly and like to get away from us and don't like to be very close to us most of the time. So this little songbird I took with a macro lens from about 50 or 75 yards away. I knew if I put this up on master or up on iNaturalist as like this, it was probably going to try to identify that tree and miss the bird. So I took it home, downloaded it to my computer. I did some editing, blow the picture up. It's not a picture I'm probably going to hang on a wall. That quality isn't there, but it was good enough when I put it up on iNaturalist to identify that as a Sage Phoebe. So again, you can take a picture from a long way, do some editing on your computer and, and, uh, and still have the same impact. And then in terms of other birds, sometimes you get silhouettes of birds like this, but this can be very, very characteristic of that upland sandpiper. So don't throw that out thinking that, well, they can't identify it. Sometimes you can. And then you're gonna take pictures sometimes with birds, especially wading birds or herons or egrets or waterfowls in this case. And you're gonna have multiple species in there. You put that up there as, as one observation, it's gonna be, it's not gonna necessarily know which one of these is supposed to identify. Or it might identify both and you gotta choose one. Best thing to do is edit that photograph to, for the snow goose and edit that photograph then for the Ross's goose and put it up as two separate observations. Remember that bird nests count. So especially if they have eggs in them, if it's just a nest, it can be very difficult. But if there are eggs in here, like the lark sparrow on the left or the blue grosbeak on the right, you can upload those as images on iNaturalist. Another thing when it comes to birds and also frogs and toads, sounds matter and they can be uploaded mostly through the computer. Again, the Android will upload sounds, the iPhone will not. Um, that's why I actually downloaded this little app called Voice Recorder, and there's lots of these free apps out there. It's like an old-fashioned tape player, cassette tape player. I can go out and record sounds that I'm hearing of birds and, and, and frogs and toads. Then I can save that as an MP3 uh, or 4. I can then email that to myself, and then I can upload it from my computer since I use an iPhone. And it works really great. And then also... Animal tracks actually count. So if you have a good set of animal tracks, a lot of times iNaturalist will identify that for you. And then roadkill, you gotta be safe here. You don't wanna be out there getting run over or endangering others or yourself when you're out there, but roadkill does count. There are actually roadkill projects uh, tracking roadkill. In fact, Phil Hardberger Park, when they were putting in that wildlife crossing uh, structure, they were actually started a project to document roadkill in and around that structure before, during, and after uh, to document to see if that made a difference in uh, that land bridge made a difference in, uh, uh, in reducing a roadkill as a result. So I wanna mention save the date for the upcoming City Nature Challenge. Um, it's a global event. There will be close to 200 cities around the globe participating in this event and, and uh, it's a four day event, April 30th through May 1st, starts on a Friday morning at midnight, goes through midnight uh, Monday night, or 11.59, I guess I should say. And then the next week is used to help identify things, to get as many things to research grade as possible um, from May 4th to May 9th. So you can participate in that aspect. But during those four days, you can go out and start taking pictures of things, uploading an iNaturalist. And this is kind of a friendly competition uh, normally, it's a friendly competition. This year, they're doing a hybrid event because of COVID, but all the cities in Texas have decided that we want to have it be that friendly competition. So we'll be looking at how many species, how many participants, how many observations in total are, are there. San Antonio, of course, is going to be doing that as well. Um, across the state, we have 14 different locations that are going to be participating, and we uh, somehow the valley is also in there, just so you all know. 
But you can see this is the San Antonio area, it includes Kerr County, by the way. But here's Bear County here and all the surrounding counties. So you can see all the locations. 78 different counties are going to be participating this year. Here is our project page. It's already up. When I printed this off a couple of days ago, it's only it was 28 days away. It's a little closer now. Um, so we're getting very excited about this. And this is a project you don't have to join. If you're just out in, the, in that several county area taking photographs, it will automatically pull your images from iNaturalist into the project. So you don't even have to join this project to, to uh, participate. Okay, so that's kind of a very convenient sort of aspect of it. If you want to find out about more detail, if you're going to be traveling during that period of time and other cities, you can go and check out these different web pages to find out different information um, and uh, uh, what what everything's about. But this is a this is something that's been done just in the last five to six years, and it's caught on a big big catch. Um, and just to show you what 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 happens last year, of course, which, when COVID started, right before the big event. So they had to kind of shut the event down and make it just something, do something in your backyard and not make it a competition. Last year, these were the metropolitan areas that participated. And we figured last year compared to 2019, we would see a big drop off. And it turns out that we actually ended up with more than uh, an additional 3000 observations uh, plus 100 species observed, more observers participating. And that's one of the things we've discovered through the pandemic is that more people have connected with nature again, um, right outside their back door and realize, oh my gosh, there's birds back here in my backyard that I didn't notice before when you're trapped at home. And uh, uh, the pan when the pandemic goes away, hopefully people will continue to keep that connection to the natural world, whether it's in their backyard or going to parks and places like that. But we actually had an increase during the coronavirus. Um, the, the, the peak of that when we were stuck at home. So it shows that nature is a great connecting force and it shows that this event um, is also very popular. So what I wanna do now, I guess what I'm gonna do is first I'm gonna see if there are any questions out there. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get out of this presentation before we go live. This is our contact information, Tanya's and mine. Um, this is my iNaturalist uh, 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 name. This is Tanya's, obviously, and then our emails here. Take a screenshot of that. If you have questions, you can go ahead and email us, and we're happy to help with that as well. But now I'm going to go ahead and escape this um, and stop sharing that for now. And so let me stop sharing here. There we go. And um, what I was going to check and see if there were any questions out there. You can put them in the chat. Um, and since there's only three of you out there, besides uh, Phil Hardberger, of course, um, if you want to unmute, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and unmute and we can just have a discussion. Uh, there's only four of us here, five of us here. Um, if there are no questions, what I'll do is go ahead and go straight to the web page. So I'll give a moment here to see how people are feeling about what we've covered so far. Susan, I see you're unmuted. So if you have a question, feel free to ask. Uh, Craig, I just want to thank you for this presentation and for some of the practical hints. I have been looking to uh, actually buy a camera, but now I'm going to get one of those Zenvo kits. So I really appreciate that suggestion. Yeah, it's I, it, somebody suggested it to me, and I went ahead and bought it because it was you know it was gla it's glass instead of those plastic ones. It's actually glass, so very high quality. It doesn't slide around on your camera. And I've been just having a blast with this thing since I've got it, um, taking photographs and just getting really sharp details, especially on those small things. So, and by the way, you can go to their website or you can actually order it off Amazon like the rest of the world orders everything off Amazon, I guess these days. So, but uh, thank you very much. I'm glad that those can be uh, useful for you. I see that Ava, I, the name on the, the, the box is Eva if, or Ava, if you wanna uh, chime in. Thank you. Yes, uh, regarding that camera also, um, is it easy on, easy off? Can you uh, pull it off quickly and put it oh. on quickly? Oh, the Zenvo thing? We, yeah, yes. absolutely. Yeah, you just, in fact, they when you buy it, it comes with a little carry case and there's a lanyard and there are two lenses. There's actually an outside lens that is a wide angle lens. I don't use that. I use that to cover as a cover for the macro lens. Um, and you just unscrew it very easily. You can, un you can unclip the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the macro lens from the lanyard, 
hook it right into your camera. And in fact, um, I think I have it handy here. Let me see if I can pull it out for you. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to see it. This is the case that it comes in right here. Okay. Yep. And there's a zippered case. When you open it up, it looks like, here's the lanyard. And it looks, the device looks like this right there. Okay. And so this is, this outer lens is the wide angle. It's not that big a deal to me anyway. But when you unscrew that too, this is your your macro, 15 power macro. So it's got a clip on it. And the nice thing about the clip is this is rubber here and rubber here. So that when you put it on the phone, it's not sliding around. For my iPhone, I don't even take the cover that I have off of it. I just match it up. And the nice thing about this too, and I'll try to show this to you, I'll get it lined up. The lens is big enough that you can, let's see here, you can see where you can match up the, 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 the Zenvo with the lens on your camera and then you're good to go to start taking pictures. So um, it's that easy, it comes right off. And uh, again, having it on the lanyard, there's a little clip right here where you can clip it off the lanyard and you're just holding that. So, um, but I, I recommend it. Um, I love close-up photography anyway, but this really is a, a, a heck of a neat device to, to be able to use. So hopefully that helps you out there. Thank you, yes, that's a great tip. Good, good. All right, well, if nobody else has any other questions about what we've covered so far, what I'm going to go ahead and do is reshare my screen with the web page, my web page account, and we'll just go through that web page, show you things if you have questions. Um, again, we've got a small enough group, go ahead and unmute and ask the question in real time. Uh, that way you don't have to try to remember that. So let me, let's see here, I'm going to go ahead and open up my account there and now share my screen again right there and hopefully let me know if someone let me know if you see my um iNaturalist home page you can just unmute yes. and let me know yes okay perfect per perfect thank you very much all right so this is what when you open when you go to the web page again the web page is where there's all kinds of things that you can do here um so when you open it up uh, first of all, you're going to see a series of tabs up here at the top and then your tabs right here for your account. You're going to notice it says upload over here. The upload is where uh, I'm going to push that button in a little bit and show you how to actually upload camera pictures in just a moment, in a few moments. Over here, you've got a little tab that looks like a mail, uh, an envelope. That way, if you're communicating with other iNaturalist users, their messages are going to come in through there. And then this right here just signifies all the different comments that people have made on your observations, verifying that that's what that was or suggesting a new ID, that kind of thing. And then finally, over in this corner, if you're navigating around your, your web page and you're in one tab over here, you're like, oh my gosh, how do I get back? You can either hit the back button over here on your, on your computer, or you can click on or just hover over this. And here are all of those things. And I always, when I, I need to go back to my, this page, I just go over here, click on dashboard and I'm back to where I started. Okay, does that make sense? So that's those tabs up here. What I wanna do up here is just kind of go through these very quickly right here. So there's an explore tab right here. If I click on explore, it's gonna pull up observations and notice this one says uh, observations in North America, 39 million of them right there. And you can display those observations in three different ways. You can either do it as a grid like this, you can do it as a list, or you can just scroll up and down that list and see what's going on around the world, or you can pull it up as a map. And then there's a, there's a list over here, a grid over here that you can look at individual things. That's for North America. The nice thing about that is if I click off of that, here are my worldwide observations. But let's say I wanted to go and I wanted to go and search for observations in Bear County. I'm going to go up here and I'm going to type in Bear County. And notice it's right there. So I'm going to click on the Bear County, Texas, USA. And it's going to automatically take me to all the observations in Bear County, 164,000 observations. Okay. And um, so now let's say I wanted to go and I wanted in Bear County. I would actually like to look for the butterfly observations in Bear County. I'm going to select super family Papillonia dia. Say that quick three times. Butterflies. So I click on that. 
It shows that there are 13,000 observations of butterflies. So if I pull up my grid, here are the most recent observations right there. I can scroll through. I can take a look at those um, and see what's being seen right now. Okay, oh, very cool. Look at that, there's a Henry's elephant. That one's red. It's obviously been eating the flowers of the, the uh, buckeye tree, the, red, the pink flowers of the buckeye tree. So that's observations right there under explore. Now let's say I go to my observation, it says your observations, go to that. This literally is going to be my observations right there. Um, and we can go there from our individual page as well. Now, if I go over to community, there are several things here. People, I can search for other iNaturalist users here by clicking on that. I can select, select or search for projects by selecting that. I can look at journal posts. I can look at a forum. The forum is a big thing where everybody's chiming in from all over the world about different issues with iNaturalist. And then over here, I'm gonna to go to more. I'm gonna skip identify for just a moment. I'm gonna to go to more and notice there's tax info, guides, places, and site stats. Uh, and then down here is help. This is one of the best places. If you have a question about iNaturalist, go to help. And here's all of their frequently asked questions. They've really done a spectacular job on their help um, page. There are video tutorials, there's getting started, there's guidelines, there's a curator guide, there's managing projects, bio blitz guide, all teachers guide right here. All kinds of help is right there under more where you find it and under and then look on help. So I wanted to let you see that because it really is one of the best ones I've ever seen. I go here if I have a question I can't figure out, that's where I'll go. All right, so if I wanna go, I'm gonna use go to places in a different way. I want to look at taxa info. And so taxa info by, by pulling this up, and it always takes a little bit to load this one for some reason, uh, more so than the other ones. I guess it's because there's a lot of data in there. Um, what that's going to do is allow you to do a search for any species that's in iNaturalist, species of plant or animal. Again, it's still loading, so bear with me here. Here it comes. So this is um, all the different species that have been logged in iNaturalist. So let's say I wanted to do a search for loggerhead shrikes. I'm going to select loggerhead shrike right here. And it's going to upload all of the different images of loggerhead shrikes. Okay, the whole record. So right here, you'll notice these are the top observer, top identifier. Last observation was yesterday. Um, total observations here. So now let's say I want to go and click on that and view all of those species. So these are all of the 3000 observations across its range in North America. But let's say I wanted to do loggerhead shrikes in Bear County, Texas. So I'm gonna click on that and it's gonna show me where loggerhead shrikes have been found. Okay, now let's say I wanted to go and look at that particular observation. Again, it shows a map of where they've been seen around San Antonio. Um, you can go, Lee Marlowe took that. I, I know Lee Marlowe. Um, you can go down here and um, you can click on the map. If I click on the map and enlarge it by clicking this little box right here. And then I can zoom in and I can find out exactly where that loggerhead shrike has been seen. Notice there's a lot of observations. These little individual observations are right here. Notice this one's surrounded by that. Um, and so that shows me exactly where I might go to look for a loggerhead shrike, okay? And you can do that with any of those observations. Very, very valuable stuff. All right, so that's how you can use the species search under taxa info. So really, really valuable. Another thing I wanna show you, so let's go to that, back to that image. And you'll notice right down here, there's some copyright information. You can protect your photographs so nobody can use them. You can open them up so some people can use them under circum certain circumstances. If I click on this, it says some rights reserved. Um, so if I go ahead and click on that, nope, let's cancel that. Click on that right there. Let's click on the big image. All right, I'm gonna get rid of that. Hang on, I'm messing around here. So what does that mean? Oh, that's right, you click on the actual thing. So here's your attribution uh, limits, that always pops up. You're free to share it, adapt it, 
uh, it does ask that you give an attribution, non-commercial uses, no additional restrictions. So let's say you're out there and you need a picture for a poster you're putting together or a presentation you're putting together of some species that you don't happen to have pictures of. You can go to iNaturalist, look at these, check out to see if the copyright gives you opportunities. Again, you click on that and then go up here and click on the specifics so that you can go back to that screen right there like that. So I wanted to show you that again so it wasn't so confusing. So again, this is a valuable thing. I use this, I do a lot of presentations and I'll go to iNaturalist when I don't have a particular image and I'll upload those images and then give the attribution so that uh, it, can, it can work. All right, so now I'm done with all of this right here. Oh no, I've got to identify, let's go to identify and then we'll come back to my, my, my tabs. So this is where you go if you're gonna help other people identify what they are looking at. Now, right now, this is all the stuff in North America that needs help with identification. Well, I'm not focused on, I don't wanna focus on that. I'm going to go ahead and click Texas. And notice you don't just type it and hit go, you wanna actually select the drop down from the drop down. So here are all the recent observations in Texas. Now, there's a couple of things here. Notice where you've got an observation right here. A couple of things I can do. I you can click on the observation, or if I see from that observation that, yep, yeah, that is a ladder-backed woodpecker, I can go ahead and click Agree. And notice how it says Reviewed up here. And now I've helped that person get their observation to confirm their observation and help it get to research grade. Now, let's say I wanted to actually, let's find another one here. Um, well, oh, let's look at this one. So I'm looking at this and I'm pretty sure it's a monarch, but I wanna look at it. I click on the image, it's gonna upload the whole thing. Now that I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, yep, that's a monarch butterfly. I'm gonna come over here to Ken Butler's suggested ID and I'm gonna hit agree. That's funny, Ken Butler's a friend of mine. Um, and now I've added that up. It's now a research grade observation right there. And I can even add a comment if I want to. I can say, nice photo, Ken. And I can hit save, which it will do. There it is right there. And now I'm done with that observation. When I come back to it, notice that it's been reviewed, okay? Now let's say I want to do, um, I don't wanna look through all of these to find only butterflies. I can come up here and I can start typing butterflies, select that from their drop down, And now it's just gonna show me all the different butterflies that have not been identified that need help with. You'll notice there's 754 of them. I can pull out my butterfly field guide or guides and start running through these and trying to help them identify what these butterflies are. So for example, this one right here, I know that's a Henry's elfin. So I'm gonna go ahead and help them identify that. I know that this is a little yellow. This is a great way <coughs> for you to contribute from your desktop. It's also a great way for you to learn what the butterflies out there are. So that's pretty cool if you ask me. So let's, uh, so you can, again, contribute to iNaturalist through this manner. Uh, and I love doing it. I love doing it. I'm kind of a, a taxonomic geekoid. So I like to be able to, to sharpen my skills or keep my skills sharp by, by going through and helping people out with those things. So that's under identify. Again, really cool. Now I'm going to go back to my dashboard. So I'm going to go all the way over here. I'm going to click dashboard. I want to go back to my home page, basically. All right. So there's my home page. This is where I am. Now look at here. I'm going to go to my profile page and open this up. Here's what the initial page looks like. I'm following seven people right here. I've got my observations here. I can look at species identifications, all of this. I can also edit my account settings. I got to upload a new picture. I could change my, my bio description. Okay, all kinds of things. I can come down here and I can go, notice it has account, notifications, relationships. I can click on notifications. I can go in here and change all kinds of settings on my account. So just so you know, that's there. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back over to my dashboard right here. And again, here's my observations right there. And again, if I wanna edit, let's say I took a picture of this and I wanted to add a picture, I could click on that observation. I can come up here and hit edit. Also, by the way, let's say you wanna take it off, you can actually delete 
your observation if you want to. Um, but if I want to edit my observation, I click on edit. I can now add photos right here. I can add a second photo. I can double check the location right here. I can make notes in here. I can add tags, which means just, just uh, highlighted words that people can search for. Um, when I'm done with any of my editing, the thing I have to make sure I do is hit save observation or else your changes don't get saved. So you have to scroll down a little bit to find that. Okay, so let's go back to my dashboard. So that's under observation. And again, you can edit your observations there or through by selecting on the observation, doesn't matter. The calendar is kind of neat because it shows you when you took those images and uploaded. Here's one with eight observations. Here's one with three observations. I can go back and check. Instead of searching through my 2000 observations and go, I took a picture of that thing on the 31st of March. Go to the 31st of March, click on that. And I believe, I'm hoping, if I'm right, yeah, it is. It should pull up those three observations. And there they are. So now I can go check back to those specific observations. So that's kind of a cool thing to have. All right, let's go back to the dashboard. And here are your, here's your ID page right here. So you can see how many you've done. And then you can put journal notes in there if you want to. And the one thing I wanted to show you is add or to look for projects. You click on the projects tab. These are all the projects that I've joined and or created that I administer. Again, in order to create a project, you have to have a place. And in order to create a place, if it's not already there, you have to have 50 observations in your account before you can do that. So let's say I want to search for a project. I showed you this in the presentation, but let me just do it real time. Here's our page. Um, I'm going to search. And again, let's talk about, let's just do Shrike and see what pulls up here, if anything. Oh, look, eight uh, uh, loggerhead Shrike projects. Okay. So I could join any of those projects. Let's see if I wanted to click on that one. Right here, I've actually joined this project, so I have some observations in here. But you would click here if you're going to join it. Let me let me go back to find one. I don't think I'm in this particular project, so I'm going to double. I'm going to click left click on that one time. It will pull it up here. Give it just a moment. There it is. These are larder lockers for strikes. So if I want to join this project, first of all, if I want to read the terms and rules, I can click on this. It says Submit geo-reference photos of prey items naturally cached by shrikes in North America. So I like that. Um, so now I know what the terms and rules are. So I want to join this project right here. I can read more about the project, who the project curators are. Curators are. It says, do you want to uh, receive updates about this project? I don't necessarily need that. It says, do you want to make your private obscured observation coordinates visible to the private uh, project curators. Yes, but only if I add the observation to the project myself. Yes, no matter what. So you can protect your observations if need be. I'm going to leave that there. I'm going to hit yes, I want to join. And now it's going to populate on my project list. Okay, let me go back to my dashboard. So that's one way to look for a project, join a project if you wish. Okay, now let's just say if you go to projects, click on that. And you say, I want to start a project very quickly. And there's more detail to it. But if you want to start a project, you're going to click on this page. You're going to come down here. There's lots of stuff to read. But basically, you're going to do a collection project. You get started. You have to type in a name for the project. You can upload an image or another image here to pretty up your page, if you will. You can select the background color here. You do have to put a description of what your project is right here. And then when you come down, you can select your taxa. If you leave it empty, that means everything, plants and animals will come into your project. You do have to select a place. Um, so that's something very, very important. And then you can limit your users or leave it blank and anybody can contribute to your project. Then you come down here and you can collect on these different things, needs ID, research grade, or you can even hit casual, media type, any um, establishment means uh, native, any, so native or introduced. Then you can come down here and you can either leave it open-ended in terms of your date and time, 
or you can put a range. So it could be a week long project or a month long project or a one day project. Uh, that's usually done with BioBlitz type uh, events. So those are there. And then you would hit done to create your project. Notice you are the administrator of that project, okay? The key to creating a project is you have to have a place, okay? So I wanna show you where you go to look for that. So if I go up here, I'm gonna go and go to more. I'm gonna click on places right here and I could find a place. So I'm just gonna type one in that I know it, that is out there. I'm gonna type in Cibolo Cottage and I'm gonna do a search for Cibolo Cottage. And there it is right there. This happens to be my yard. Um, so now I know that there's a place. So now I can go and type that in. So let's go back and let's go and say, I wanna go type um, Phil Hardberger Park. So let's see, Phil Hardberger Park. Let's do a search for that and see if there is a place for that. Lots of choices here. So if I'm gonna create a project in Phil Hardberger Park, I would just type in Phil Hardberger Park Hardberger Park in that project place location tab, and it would populate your choice there. Okay, I know that's a little rushed because we don't have a time to go into it fully uh, to get to the last thing I wanna be able to show you. But anyway, so that's a little bit about projects. So it's kind of fun to follow what's going on out there. Um, by the way, it's kind of cool. All right, so now let's go to, let's say I've taken some pictures on my camera and I wanna upload those images to iNaturalist. So what I'm gonna do is, and I'm gonna try and do both of these. So I'm gonna shrink this down a little bit and I'm gonna pull up my folder that has the images that I want to upload, okay? And I'm gonna shrink this down a little bit. I'm gonna click on, um, this right here, which by the way, if it was full screen, it would say upload right here, or I can add observations through that tab. I'm gonna go ahead and hit upload right there. I'm gonna shrink that down. Notice it says you can drag and drop or you can choose files. I prefer to drag and drop. So I'm gonna go down through here and I'm gonna select that one to drag and drop into that, I hope. Let's see if it'll do it the first time. Nope, there you go. And then I wanna add this image as well. And I want to add, let's see here, that image right there. What I'm doing basically is some, what's known as batch editing. Let's see here, I want to add this image right here. So I'm dragging and dropping, I'm left clicking and dragging and dropping. All right, so I've taken those five images from my disc from my camera. All right, so I've got, uh, obviously I've got a, one separate one here, a separate one here, a separate one here. Now I have two of these that are the same species. I wanna combine those. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna click on this and I'm gonna drag it over here. Now notice I've gone to four observations, but notice it says one of two. So now I can double check. There are both of my images, okay? Now let's say here, I wanna figure out what this is. So I'm gonna click on species name and it's gonna load suggestions for me. I happen to know that this is a little wood satter. So I'm gonna go ahead and click little wood satter. This one's already populated. Um, so it's already told me that this is a um, winter wren. So there you go. But if you don't believe it, you can go ahead and hit load suggestions again. There it is, winter wren. I'm gonna populate that. This one's already chosen that these are um, uh, not a great picture, but still usable that these are um, um, blue wing teal. So that one, I'm gonna go ahead and see if that's actually right. I don't know if that's right or not. So let me just go ahead and reload. Blue wing teal right here, that's right. It picked, it actually picked the wrong one. So again, it's never, it's not always perfect. So you wanna double check. So this is actually blue wing teal. And then over here, I'm gonna click load suggestion. And that is a barred owl right there. Notice the date and time are already on here. So that's taken care of. Notice that they're all Bernie, Texas, but I wanna make sure that the accuracy is okay. So I'm gonna individually click on this first one. It's gonna pull up a map. It's gonna show me this little red button right here is where that picture was taken. And now notice that I'm using a satellite. I could also pull up a map if I wanted to. I prefer to use the satellite. 
Um, but that's about where I took the picture. I can't be exactly sure. But what I'm going to do is notice there's no accuracy here. And I want to put an accuracy on it because I want it to be useful. So I'm going to left click one time and notice it went from that symbol to this circle with five white dots. By grabbing a hold of one of the white dots, I can enlarge it and make sure that's my coverage area. Notice my accuracy is now 10. So I'm going to do that. And now I've got a better accuracy. Let's see here. Let me double click it again. Yeah, I'm good to go. OK. All right. Oh, one of the things you might do is make sure you update observation. There you go. Now I'm going to do this with the, the uh, same with the uh, Winter wren, it was down in the creek, but the bird was here. I'm going to make that a little bit bigger. What this does is also if somebody's looking for this bird, they have an idea of about where to go look at the nature center. And then this one, this is kind of a unique one because this was one that I took the picture of while I was standing here, but the birds were at the far end down here. I don't want to take a picture of where I was standing. I want to take a picture of where the birds were. So I'm going to click here and that's about where the birds were. So notice that I moved it to make sure it recorded the actual location. And then the final one I want to check on is the barred owl. And again, I was standing in one location, taking a picture. I was standing on the creek, but the birds was, was up in one of these trees here. So I'm going to do that. Now I've got all of these ready to go. Now, a couple of things I want to um, put three of these into a project. Um, and if they were all the same topic area, um, I could go birds of Texas, all three of these, but now I'm going to have to do it individually by clicking on project. And I'm going to go to birds of Texas for that one. All right. And then I'm going to click on this one. I'm going to go to projects. I'm going to go to birds of Texas and I'm going to go to the barred owl. Click the same thing, Birds of Texas. All right, and then this one, because it's a butterfly, I'm gonna join different projects. So let's see, I think I have Lepidoptera of Texas right there. All right, so now when I click on this, you'll notice it says it's joined one project. But now here's a new thing you could, another thing you could do. All of these pictures were taken at Cibolo Nature Center. I want to join Cibolo Nature Center's project, but I don't wanna do it individually. So I'm gonna come up here and hit select all. I'm gonna come down to projects. I'm gonna collect Cibolo Nature, or select Cibolo Nature Center and Farm like that. All right, I'm going to hit done. And when I click on this, and I click on this, notice the number of projects is two. And if I click on that, I have, let me try that again. Click on projects. You can see that it had, you had to look really quick. Um, there we go, get rid of something. I'm just trying to restart my computer. So now I've got everything I want. I've got the names of the things. I've got the date and time. I've got good accuracy. I've joined the projects I want. All I have to do now is hit submit for observations. And here we go. And it takes a moment to, in order for it to do it. But this way you can upload multiple images off of your camera and do it all at one sitting instead of one at a time. You can do it one at a time if you want. And again, here we go. So here they are right up in here. By the way, these different colors indicate different taxes. So green is plants, uh, butterflies, or maybe it's uh, invertebrates are red, um, birds are blue, that kind of thing, just so you, in case you were wondering. By the way, if I pull this map up right here, just to kind of show you, these are where all my observations are in Texas. If I scan out, this shows where all my observations are, wherever I've traveled, I've made observations, okay? So again, that's kind of a cool thing to be able to look to see where you've been spending most of your time. All right, well, that is what I wanted to show you on this aspect. So what I'm gonna do is stop sharing my screen at this point. Unless somebody has a, uh, Susan or Eva, Eva, do you, either of you have questions while we're on the, I'm sharing the web page? Not right now. Thank you, though. Okay, very good. So I'm going to go ahead and, and Eva, what about you? I don't have any questions. In fact, I've got to, we're in the Guadalupe Mountains and we've got to start camp right now to get out of here. Okay, so okay. I'm going to have to say okay. goodbye. 
Well, I'm glad you had a signal that could join us today. I can't so believe we had a signal. I'm so sorry for the interruption <laughs> when we started, but thank no, you so no much, problem. Craig. This is um, great information. I Very wish good. more and people were joining in so they could well, uh, witness it. This is this is why we keep doing it. We I do this. I travel the whole state doing this for groups all over the state. So and make, where get out are there you? And do, where uh, are I'm you in, based? I'm based out of Bernie down by uh -huh. San Antonio, but I uh -huh. traveled this when the pandemic hit. I was in El Paso training people, so well, we, this we travel great. everywhere. So thank you so hey, much. And, and, hey, and Eva, just so you know, this has been recorded. The entire okay. thing, because I know you came in a little late, so yes. I'm sure that they'll be able to share that with you later if you make okay. a request. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Take, take good care. Enjoy the Guadalupe Mountains. I'm All jealous. right. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for joining us for this talk. If you're interested in learning more about Hardberger Park and the conservancy that supports it, please visit philhardbergerpark.org. The Conservancy is a member-based nonprofit that relies on donations to support educational activities in the park. If you're able to give five or ten dollars to support programs like today's, we would really appreciate it. Thanks very much, everybody. I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. Take good care. Bye-bye. <laughs>